Welcome to Agronomy Week. We're here at the world famous Field of Dreams movie site in Dyersville, Iowa. And we're gonna be getting our hands dirty today, talking about all things baseball and agronomy. As I think about going from Kansas to Tennessee to Illinois, I would imagine that the soil is probably pretty variable between all those areas. Uh, as you think about, you know, all the different soil characteristics, what are some of the things as, as technical agronomists that, uh, that you're thinking of when it comes to soil? Well, I think soil type, um, first and foremost, because that drives a lot, of, a lot of things where you're looking at what your water holding capacity is, what your CECs can be, um, soil texture and the, um, how that plays into products that we can place, um, things of that nature. That, that's what I think of certainly right off the bat. Yeah, for us, we're, we're thankful for the Midwest, for our soil. You know, our, our soils came from the dust bowl. We got less alluvial soils, river valley soils. Uh, but the one, the one major factor for us when we're looking at corn, soybeans, and cotton is usually pH. So we, we, our nutrients become at a limiting factor when we get to a, to a risky pH. So for our growers, pH is a, is a big number to focus on. And, and in our area, Clint, I would say, you know, drainage is a huge factor for us. I mean, you look out here today at Dyersville, uh, needs some better drainage here right now so we can uh, get in the field, but you know, we've got a lot of tile systems. So is it tile drained? Is it well tiled? Is it just kind of got a little tile in it? Um, you know, what's the organic matter? What's the natural drainage of the soil? That goes back to soil type and CEC and, and nutrient holding capacity and uh, depth of soil. And you know, we're very blessed in Illinois with wonderful soil, but if we can't get rid of the excess water that we have often, um, that really limits the productivity of that soil. Well, you, you talk about uh, you know pH and and some of the nutrient holding capacities. Uh, where does soil come into play for like if I'm making a decision on let's say nitrogen or some of my other fertility? I mean, do I have to take that all into consideration? Yes, certainly. So uh, in my geography, we have a lot of uh, sandy soils, and so. Once we look at our nutrient management plan and what those best management practices are based off of that soil type, we are going to apply our, our nutrients at different timings and at different rates based off of that soil type than somebody like Lance who has a lot heavier soil and isn't going to have to be concerned about losing um, that nutrient due to that soil right. type. And, and, and we naturally get more nutrients out of our soil. Um, for, for Wes and Holly, you know, they're, they're going to need to apply most of the nutrient that their crop's going to need. You know, our soils have a lot of nutrient holding capacity. And if you've been on a good fertility program and you're blessed with a good soil, a lot of what that crop's going to need for that growing season is, is already there. We're just worried about can the plant access it? Can it get a hold of it? Can it get it away from the soil? If you've got a really high CEC and a lot of clay, that soil binds those nutrients pretty tightly. And even though there's a lot of nutrient there, how available are they to the plant? And, and I would assume that uh, in order to understand all of these different characteristics, we got to go take some samples or some tests, uh, I would assume. I just look at it, Clint. I just look know. at it and know exactly yeah. what is uh, happening. How often is somebody testing, uh, testing their soils? I'll, I'll give the, the guys at home credit for that. You know, our area is one of the, one of the first areas to adapt variable technology. Uh, they, they've been very good to adapt that. Usually we're set up on a grid soil sample system where we're, we're grid soil sampling, you know, two and a half to three acre grids. And that's usually on a, every other year to a three year platform. Gotcha. Very similar in my geography where um, folks are very diligent in their nutrient management plans and grid, grid sampling and um, variable rating those, those fertility programs to kind of meet the needs of, of what those soil sample and soil testing uh, protocols are, are delivering for insights. Now, as, as you think uh, across uh, all the crops, corn, soybeans, cotton, uh, are any of them handled differently when it comes to fertility? Are you looking at those soil tests differently and, and treating it for cotton versus if I'm going to put corn on it? Absolutely. You know, uh, nutrients are, <laughs> that's kind of a sore subject this year with, the, we all, you know, know where the prices are, but, but our growers are aware and our dealers are aware that to make the yield expectations that we have, we've got to put that food out there to feed that goal. So, uh, but in our part of the world, especially our, the way our CECs are aligned, we really got to stagger that because our soils just can't hold the amount of nitrogen at one timing. So we're going to stagger that out. And I think going forward, you'll continue to see with technology that we have like fertigation, we'll continue to stagger that out even even further to, to manage. You know, it's, it's, it's the sustainable thing to do as well. So. Virtually all crops utilize the same 
you know, essential and, and micronutrients, macro micronutrients, but they utilize them differently, different percentages, different ratios. And so each different crop is going to have a different set of nutrients that are probably more critical for that crop. And so it's not only, you know, the timing and related to the soil, but it relates back to, you know, what is the need for that particular nutrient for that particular crop? And, and how do I manage that nutrient so that that plant is, is never, hopefully, never lacking for that nutrient through the growing season? Now, when you think about, uh, you know, the, the, the seed and the plant interacting with the soil, um, does, does different soil mean different susceptibility to different diseases or things of that nature or does that come into play in our market it does i mean our you know a, a lot of our pathogens that are prevalent in heavy high organic matter poorly drained soils are you know less prevalent in you know light low organic matter timber soils or sandy soils i mean sudden death syndrome and soybeans would definitely be related to soil type and soil moisture crown rot and corn is definitely related to soil type and soil moisture so there are interactions between diseases and soil as well because every pathogen has the environment that it prefers and the soil environment changes depending on lots of factors you know, a, a lot of the other conversations that I hear is all about, you know, stewardship of the land and whether it's uh, erosion or cover crops or things of that nature. Is that uh, having a, an impact on, on farmers' decisions as they're looking at, you know, getting their crop in for this season? For us, it has. You know, that's one thing about, about the, the Mid-South. We've really implemented cover crops over the last eight or ten years, and, and that's been a learning curve, you know, because with that comes other planting strategies, right? So we've learned... You know, in some situations, depending on the crop, corn might have terminated a little bit earlier. Um, things like cotton and soybeans, we've actually figured out ways to only burn down where we're going to plant and leave the rest. So it does, it really changes the game up of, of your planting strategy if you're going to implement something like a cover crop. I'm in an area where um, no-till has been the norm for a long time. You know, uh, Wes mentioned his uh, his soils that he got during the Dust Bowl. Well, I think, I think we sent them <laughs> down there, and so we've learned a lot around... Um, you know, maintaining that um, that cover on the on the soil surface through through no till, and um, you know, really trying to work to improve our our soil um, through that no till practice by less moisture loss through um, the cover to help try to shade out weeds, those types of, of things. I think all you know, all farmers, you know, there's a always been a strong connection to the land from the farmer to the soil and, and especially if it's been passed down through generations and I think every farmer wants to leave his farm in better shape for the next generation than, than it was when he got it and so all those conservation practices are you know they're, they're great for the soil you know as, as Wes mentioned sometimes you have to learn new ways to raise your crop so that what you're doing to benefit your soil isn't a detriment to your crop uh, and we, we really want to improve the soil in ways that improve or at least maintain the productivity of the crop and that's kind of the best of both worlds if you can protect the soil improve the soil and improve the productivity of the soil for the crop and i think it's also fair to say that um, conservation practices like cover crops or no-till there's no one size fits all you know that may look different in in other areas and so um, finding and trying new ways um, on your own farm is is great, but understand that there may not be a one size fits all. That you know, someone hundreds of miles away from me is is um, implementing implementing a certain practice. It may work on your farm. It may not, just based off of your environment, soil type, etc. Stick around for an unusual baseball story you might not have heard. We just learned how soil plays a key role in farming. As we talk to James Bentliff, we'll learn how a particular mud plays a huge role in baseball everywhere. So James, you're the sole supplier of Lena Blackburn's baseball rubbing mud. Tell us what it is and what does it do? The mud is a, uh, it's a natural deglossing uh, agent that um, was discovered back in the 30s by Lena Blackburn. Um, it's used to take the, uh, the slippery, shiny coating off of baseball um to make it easier to grip for the pitcher and um safer to throw actually that's that's where the whole concept came from um after the dead ball era 
they were having trouble with pitchers having control. And uh, Lena found this mud and, and found a way to make, you know, give a little grip to the baseball. I mean, before Lena Blackburn's baseball rubbing mud, was there anything else that they were using? They were using, they used the same ball for multiple games. Um, we'd use a ball until the, till the cover fell off. And after the, uh, I guess it was in the, in the 20s, um, there was a, a batter hit in the temple by a wild pitch. And they decided they had to use, that's when they just started, decided they had to use new baseballs for every game. Um, once they did that, they realized that they had to take, had to make, uh, make it so the pitcher could grip the ball. And they tried other things, tried tobacco juice and shoe polish and infield dirt to try and, um, you know, take the gloss off the new ball. But everything that they tried was damaging the ball and putting, you know, putting scores in the leather. So it was basically just giving them, it, it was it was like the pitcher using a, a nail file on the ball because everything they used was damaging the ball. Um, Lena found this mud and played with it, experimented with it, and um, got it to a point where he used it on a baseball, and it was you couldn't even tell it was it was being used. So what's the special ingredient or what's that, what's that one mineral in there that's, uh, that's really special? Well, it's, it's been, um, it's been studied and the, the biggest, um, the most prevalent mineral is a, a uh, it's a Fells bar, which is one of the minerals in, a, in clay. Um, and if you look at it under a microscope, it looks like little tiny shards of glass. Uh, I'm pretty sure that's what does the, um, the, the coating, it takes the coating off. So what kind of impact has the mud had on the baseball? I mean, has it moved any stats? A pitcher can increase the, the, uh, spin on the ball. Um, you know, the amount of revolutions per second or whatever it is. Have you ever had any trouble with the harvest, like maybe during a drought year? Yes. Yes. Uh, a drought season makes it uh, a little harder for me to harvest. I, 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 have to, I have to work harder. I have to collect more. Um, during a drought season, it, it gets a, a gritty a real gritty texture and that doesn't work real well on baseballs. That's, that's not good for baseball. So it takes more, more harvest to get the prime, you know, the prime mud. Now, you know, in these days of high technology, they're always trying to replicate things using synthetic material and things of that nature. Have they tried to do that with your mud? <laughs> yes. Uh, they came out with a, with a product. They called it baseball rubbing mud or they called it rubbing mud. And, you know, they, they got a whole bunch of it together and jarred up and ready to try and sell. And um, the people who tried it didn't, didn't like it. It didn't do what it was supposed to do. Um, now they come to me for mud. <laughs>